Most of you know what today is. Today is the question and answer Sunday. And um, usually what we do today is you ask questions and I answer them. Um, I already have three questions that's going to take all of our time. So today I'm not going to ask that um, you give me questions here. But if we're done uh, in 15, 20 minutes and we have a few more minutes, uh, I will entertain uh, any other question that you may have. But don't forget that maybe when it gets close to the third Sunday or any time you have a question on your mind you would like for me to deal with on third Sundays, just email them to me or write them out and give them to Frida uh, um, to make sure that I get them. And I will try to uh, work on them before we get here. As I've said always, that if, you, if it's a question that is posted to me while I'm here, I may not be able to answer it. But I, will, I promise you that I will work on it and uh, maybe do it for the next uh, uh, third Sunday when we ask a question and answer, answer period. Amen? Amen. The, f the first question that uh, was sent to me is a question that says, Hello, Pastor. I was just wondering, why is there such a big difference in the pulpit of the Catholic Church as opposed to the Baptist Church? So we're going to answer that today. The second question is, in cell group a few weeks ago, we discussed the meaning of Sabbath, S-A-B-B-A-T-H, Sabbath. It, uh, and that's not Deacon. Uh, <laughs> okay. It, it was a lively discussion, but I think it's good to get more clarity for the greater body and those in cell group. Please define Sabbath. Why is it important for the Christian to take a day of rest? Uh, why is Sunday associated as the Sabbath for Christians? Is it because this is the first day of the week? And can Christians take a Sabbath on any other day than Sunday? And uh, Follow-up suggestion, this may be a good lead to discuss pastor's sabbatical. And the last question is, what do you mean when you talk about covenant membership? Uh, this is also a good question because today we have what we call the membership class after a service there's going to be a membership class so for some of you that are going to be in the class this last question will be a transition from church to class from worship to a class to go uh, a little bit deeper into that because that's basically all we do in the membership class all right uh, first question i was just wondering why is there such a big difference in the pulpit of the Catholic Church as opposed to the Baptist Church. And I want to warn the uh, cell group leaders that the only notes I have for you is the notes to deal with the Sabbath. So you need to take some notes here. I will give you a little bit outline when I send the uh, questions to you uh, to help you in your discussion this week. And also to remind you, as a church, we're reading Romans chapters 1 through 8. Romans chapters 1 through 8 and next Wednesday we're going to see who's been reading the chapters. Okay. This question, why, uh, why is there such a big difference in the pulpit of the Catholic Church as opposed to the Baptist Church? It's really a deep question and it's a question that it's not dealing just with the content of the message, but also maybe in uh, 
uh, the place where the pulpit is actually located in, in, in the Catholic Church. Now, I, let me begin by saying all Catholic churches are not the same. There are actually three Catholic movements today. The traditional Catholic, the so-called charismatic Catholic, and there is the evangelical Catholic. That's those, they're not opposed to each other if a Catholic church is evangelical, you know. But, of course, if you call a Protestant Catholic, then it will be uh, contradictory. Uh, but this, the, the, let's do first with the basic reason why things are different in the Catholic Church as opposed to a Baptist Church or any Protestant Church. The main reason why there are differences is because the Catholic, the Catholic Church does not deal with just the Bible. The Catholic Church believes in the Bible plus. So the Catholic Church does not just use what we have today uh, in the evangelical and Protestant churches, the 66 books in the Bible. We have 37, I mean 39 in the old and 27 in the new. That's what we believe is canonical this is what we believe is authoritative for us as christians the catholic church goes beyond that they accept more than 66 books and the books that they added to their bible is referred to as the apocrypha those were the books that the general church uh, rejected as being inspired and the basic reason is because all these books, some of them were historical, some of them were doctrinal, uh, some of them were just gospel, but they contradicted some of the long-held uh, doctrine of the church uh, that was uh, basically laid out in the Old Testament. And it wasn't until one of the councils in the Catholic Church, and you don't, don't quote me on this, but I believe it was the Council of Trent, where they actually... Uh, uh, said that they will, you know, add this to uh, their books and was, were reading it as part of the books. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into some of the content of some of the apocryphal books. Some of them were really funny. And uh, you will be surprised what anybody would think this is, you know, from God. But they accepted it as, as, as part of their book. So when you get a Catholic Bible or you go to a Catholic church, or you're doing a Catholic study, and they said, turn to the book of Ecclesiasticus. You would think that they were mispronouncing Ecclesiastes, but that's not true. There's another book called the book of Ecclesiasticus. It's in the Apocrypha. If they said, turn to the book of Tobit, you know, or the book of Ezra, uh, or... Uh, Maccabees, uh, uh, and on and on and on. You, you, you know, you will say, oh, I don't have that book. It's because they have more books than you do. Okay. Even the, I'm sorry. I believe it's 27. Uh, even the Catholic Church, right, uh, Jackie? Was there 27 or 25? 27, okay. Uh, even the Catholic Church itself believes that the books are not on the same level as the canon because they refer to it as the deuterocanonical books. In other words, these are the books that belong to the second canon. Okay, so uh, that's one of the major reasons why you will not see a uh, Protestant, a Baptist, a uh, Lutheran uh, uh, evangelical church stand up and said, turn to the book of Tobit. Okay, it's, it ain't going to happen because that's not part of the book that we believe a part of our uh, canon. And that is where also the Catholic Church got a lot of the really strange practices. 
uh, and I know the, the, the question zeroes in on the pulpit, but I, I think it's good for us to know the reason why we have fundamental differences. We have very, very true fundamental differences. And uh, it relates to the fact that they have some books that are very, very questionable, even in the standard of those days, that they use as part of the book that uh, uh, guides them in their devotion, in their daily living, and everything. Not only that, but the Catholic Church believes in Bible plus tradition. Bible plus tradition. For the average Catholic, when the Pope speaks as cathedral, when he's sitting in the Sea of Peter, the actual seat that they believe Peter sat in and therefore became part of the government of the church because Jesus said to Peter in, on the island of Caesarea Philippi in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, something in there, uh, Jesus said after he was asking his disciples, who do men say that I am? And uh, they said, they said this, they said, they said, but who do you say I am? And Peter answered and said, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus replied, said, uh, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father, he was in heaven. Uh, very, very, I say unto you, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The Catholic Church interprets upon this rock, I will build my church to mean that uh, Jesus was referring to Peter. Interestingly enough, in the Greek, it does say, thou art Petros, and upon this Petra, I will build my ecclesia. Okay, so it, it did, Peter's name was Petros, which is like a, a rock, a pebble, uh, you know. And upon this rock, Petra, and you can tell the difference in the form, which is not just a small rock, but a big rock, I will build my church. Now, the interpretation is, uh, since the words are so similar, Jesus was referring specifically to Peter. He could be. Okay, but that doesn't mean he's building his church on him. Most evangelical Christians have interpreted that to be upon this confession that you have made, I'm going to build my church. So that anyone who says, thou art Christ, the son of the living God, is going to be accepted into the kingdom of God and will be part of the church. That is my position also. But I also don't have any problem with even if Jesus was talking to Peter. Okay? Because if you look at the history of the church, there are many things that Jesus said to Peter that the Catholic Church should claim. He called him Satan. You know? So you should claim he is Satan. Because he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You know? So there are a lot of other things that if you want to claim one, you should claim the others also. Uh, but anyway, we don't have time to go into the interpretation of that one. But, but the major thing is that in the Catholic Church, preaching is not the center of the worship. In fact, the pulpit in the Catholic Church is never located in the center. Now, there may be some modern churches that are doing that, but they're always to the side. Okay. And the service of the Eucharist, the, uh, what we call the communion, is to the center. Because that's the center of the Catholic worship. And there's no time that you will go to a Catholic church or worship or mass that you will not partake in the body and blood of the Lord. Because that's the center of their worship. So we're different in that. In the Catholic church... The Pope prescribes for the preachers what they're supposed to preach. Yes. Not just every Sunday. 
every time there's any gathering of the Catholic Church for worship, the communion must be served. Even at a funeral. Uh, and uh, we can go into that later. That's another issue. Uh, but the point here is that, what did I just say? <laughs> oh, the communion is the center of their worship instead of preaching. Okay, because the preaching is given to them, the priest will get what he's supposed to preach on. And sometimes you go from one church to another, they could just read it. In the Baptist church, uh, free churches, because I don't want to say Presbyterian and Anglican, because some Presbyterians also follow the same way. They get prescribed preaching uh, guidelines that they're supposed to preach. Uh, but the call of the pastor, the call of the preacher is between him and God. And therefore, the preaching in evangelical churches and in uh, Protestant churches should come from the pastor hearing from God instead of somebody else telling him what he's supposed to preach on. So those, those are the major differences. Uh, we believe preaching is the center of worship. They believe communion is the center of worship. We look at our pulpit mostly in most evangelical churches in the center to signify the centrality of preaching. They put it to the side and put the communion in the middle as the center of, of the worship. Is there anything that I've said very confusing? You don't know? Yes. Okay. 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 Just, just remember that they're trying to tie the confession of Peter on the island of Caesarea Philippi uh, to the fact that Jesus responds to it, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. They've said the rock refers to Peter, not to the confession. Evangelical churches say the rock refers to the confession and not to Peter himself. But those who believe that, okay, even if it refers to Peter, if you claim that to be the case, then you should claim everything that Jesus said about Peter to be the same. Oh, okay, now I've got it. Okay. 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 Therefore, if you say he is the rock of the church, then he is also Satan. Okay? Right. So how are you going to, you know, uh, get that clear? Yes. That, oh, okay. Uh, in other words, every word that the Pope says when he sits as cathedral is equal to the Bible. So the Pope can change, and you know that some Popes have done it. They've changed what Catholics believe based on the fact that they have that authority when they're sitting in the seat of authority. They're, because the Catholic Church believes that there is a succession of authority from F Peter to the present Pope. So every Pope passes on the key to the church to the next Pope. Okay, so that, that's what happens in that. Yes. yes. To uh, well, I have no problem with people reading them, but if you if you see them as coming from God, yes, and that would be heresy. Yeah, uh, we will consider that. I did a paper once on all of the books. Um, I don't know if I can. I I'll look to see where where it's where I put them. Uh, but this is this is a paper that all different scholars have read also. You know. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting when you go into the books and actually read the books uh, to see why the church rejected the books and don't count them as part of the church, uh, part of the authoritative canon for the church. That it will be false? Yes. 
because uh, uh, my, my understanding of not just the Old Testament but also the New Testament is that we are not to add to anything that Jesus already sanctioned or the early apostles already sanctioned as being part of the book that we're supposed to be reading. Because canonicity is a long history, and we can't do it in, you know, five minutes. You know, but, all right. Yes? I'll, I'll give you the exact date. I don't have the exact date right now, but, but I'll give it to you. It's, it's in one of the, uh, the Catholic Church had several councils that they, that they had. You have to remember that the word Catholic means one, universal. Okay? At one point, there was only one Catholic church. And we all belong to it. But when that Catholic church started doing things that were against the Bible, that was what started the Reformation. That was what started the protest. That's why we're called Protestants. We're protesting some of the things that the church was doing that is not in line with the Bible. And one man that was specifically singled out was Martin Luther. And he wrote what is usually called his 95 Thesis and nailed it to the door of the church. And uh, they were going to burn him, you know, whatever. The Catholic Church has done some really nasty stuff uh, that we can't talk about right now. But, but the point is that uh, they had several councils of the church where several things were pronounced. In one of them, the apocrypha was added to. At, yeah, it, well, yes, it would be in somewhere around 300 to 400 uh, uh, AD. Yeah, somewhere in there. I don't want to give you the wrong date because some of you are going to check it out and say, Pastor, you were wrong. Okay. Uh, so that's the, the first question. Ooh, it took a long time. Okay, we're not going to have a follow-up on the second one. Uh, the second one is, in a cell group a few weeks ago, we discussed the meaning of Sabbath. It was a lively discussion, but I th think it's good to get more clarity for the greater body. Please define Sabbath. The word Sabbath appears 167 times in the Bible. It appears 108 times in the Old Testament and 59 times in the New Testament. The word Sabbath means stop. Yes. S-T-O-P, stop, or cease. Cease doing what you're doing. Stop doing what you're doing. That's what Sabbath means. Right? Deacon? Okay. Ah. <laughs> huh? Yeah, <laughs> the word means stop, and the original, well, it's not the first time that it was used, but the original part of the commandment was in the Ten Commandments, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, and we're not going to have time to read because our time is already up, but there are several passages in the Old Testament where Sabbath was pronounced. But it goes back to the original one when, when God was creating the world. After the sixth day, the Bible said he rested from all his work. That's the word Sabbath. He Sabbath from all his works that he was doing. And God commanded his people. The Israelites, he said, you should not work on that day. It's a day of rest. In fact, if you look at some, uh, those of you that are going to be attending Wednesday's cell group, we're going to give you some more passages for you to look up. Uh, uh, some 
people that worked on the Sabbath were commanded to be killed. That's how serious it was. So, the Sabbath simply means God says, I created you, I know your body, I know everything about you, and I know you cannot go on working forever. You will die and kill yourself. Stop. There's going to be a day you should stop. And the Sabbath is the seventh day. Today that will be a Saturday. Okay? There's nowhere in the Bible that the Sabbath is associated with Sunday. Not in the Bible. In today, maybe. But in the Bible, the Sabbath was never associated with Sunday. I know some of you grew up with parents. I grew up with my mother, too, that doesn't want you to even do anything on Sunday. And she didn't even, she wasn't that religious. But she just knew that there was something about Sunday you should not do anything. You know, you can't go out, you can't do anything, just rest. Just go to church, you know. But there's nothing about Sabbath in the Bible that's related to worship. Are you still with me? You can go do your research. There's nothing about Sabbath that relates to worship. There's no place in the Bible where it says you should worship me on the Sabbath day. God said rest. Now, of course, it's also very important to know you don't have a Sabbath if you don't work. Okay, you got to stop from doing something. Don't say, this is my Sabbath. No, you're lying because you have not been doing anything. The Sabbath is provided to give you rest. To rest from what you've been doing because God did the same thing. And he commanded us to do the same thing. Let me see. What else I wanted to, uh, the question. I, I'm sorry? School has, has been work? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I've, I've never thought about that, but. but yeah. <laughs> good argument. <laughs> Oh, you guys going to make it so difficult. <laughs> I, I think, I think uh, work, remember that all work is not paid. You know, it's not. There are a lot of women, if we pay them, there'll be too much, too much money, you know. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> Especially my wife. Amen. She's working every minute, you know. I said, okay. Well, I, I, I'll leave that alone. I don't want to get into any trouble. Right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, why is it important for Christians to take a day of rest? Yeah, I think it's important for us to take a day of rest because God did not create a machine. And even sometimes machines break down. I, I specifically took this. When I got to this church, one of the things I told the leaders of the church is, I'm going to have a day of rest. And you can ask my children when they were growing up. My day of rest meant church is not going to interfere with me spending time with you guys. Unless there's an extreme emergency. I took that very seriously because it's the command of God. And I need to pass on to them what God gave to me. And need to spend time with them from doing everything else that I'm doing to focus on my own family. Okay, So we need to take some time in our lives because if you just... You, you work for somebody. You keep working, 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 working. When they're going to fire you, they're not going to look at you and say, you worked for me for 17 years. You didn't take this. You didn't take that. They're going to fire you and 
by the time you even leave the room, the door will be closing behind you. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> take it seriously. Because God took it seriously. And he commanded his people. He said, this is what you're to do. The day of, there's no, even in the Old Testament, he never said, even sometime in Nehemiah, it was, they were trying to associate it with, and they were corrected right away. This is a day that God wanted you to rest. That's it. Every day should be a day of worship of God. Every day. So we don't need a special day to say this. Now, we Christians chose Sunday. Sunday is not Sabbath. Sunday is actually the first day of the week. It's not the seventh day. The seventh day is the Sabbath. Now, that's why the seventh day Adventists are wrong to worship on Saturday. Because Saturday is not a Christian Sabbath. And even if it is a Sabbath, the Sabbath is not a day for worship, it's a day to rest. I think we misinterpret the Bible when we use it for something else. Okay, is it, uh, why is Sunday associated as Sabbath for Christians? Again, I say this is a wrong association. Some people do that, but it's not correct. It's not, they don't get it from the Bible. Uh, and also, can Christians take a Sabbath on any day than Sunday? Yes, my Sabbath is Thursday. And some people will still call me on Thursday. And they'll say, I know this is your day. I'll say, if you know, why are you calling me? <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, but, yeah, we should take a day that we rest from our labors. Okay? Uh, even if they entice you with that overtime and double pay, they just want you to go against the law of God. And when you get sick, they'll be the first to fire you. Yes. So you follow God and you won't do wrong. Uh, uh, most of our time is gone, so I'm not going to ask follow-up questions. Oh, okay. What's the follow-up question? Well, maybe yeah. Said, no, I'm just following what you just said. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was also suggested, again, uh, the sabbatical, the pastor's sabbatical is instituted so that the pastor can take some time off. Uh, different churches do it different ways. For example, in this church, you didn't think I deserve it in my first 20 years. So, <laughs> but, but uh, you've been good in the last eight years by making sure that I go and take some time. Basically, what you do uh, in pastor's sabbatical is either you write a book or you uh, do something that you like to do. Like the first time I took sabbatical from here, I went to French school. I attended the University of uh, Benin in Abome for three months and studied French. Um, the last time I tried to write a book, but it, it wasn't going. But, uh, but that, is, that is a time that you set aside to do something different than what you've been doing for the past three years or something like that. Okay. Um, sorry, I don't have a follow-up uh, question. Uh, I, I'm not allowing that. But if you do have follow-up question, write it and send it to me. I'll deal with it the next time. Uh, with the covenant membership question, since we're going to have a covenant uh, membership class, I'm just going to mention the seven things that we believe are the principles for church covenant membership. Yeah. Somebody said six? Oh, okay. Okay, there, was, there are seven of them. One of them within number, but there are seven. Okay. The first of it, of course, is that 
to become a covenant member, you have to commit to the Bible as the word of God. And also in committing to that, you're saying, I'm going to read it on a regular basis. I'm going to have a time of devotion, time of prayer, spending time with God. I really believe the reason why many pastors have problem with their members is that they're thinking so different. Uh, so differently because one is coming from the Bible, the, the other is coming from tradition. And I guarantee you that if you are a pastor or a teacher who is after God's heart, you will not have any problem with your Bible reading members. Because they can tell when you're not in the Bible. And uh, if a person is not in the Bible, they're going to be a problem. Because, for example, why do I have to convince, convince you that you have to come to church? It's because you don't read your Bible. I mean, we can go into other things. But anyway, that's, that's the one that's why that is the first primary thing we believe is fundamental to uh, church covenant membership. Number two, that you will attend church on a regular basis. And Sunday school or cell group. In other words, it's better to attend both of them. Church, Sunday school, and cell group. But if you can't, you will come to church and you will attend at least one of the two. Either Sunday school or cell group. Number three, that you will honor the Lord with at least 10% of your income. Number four, that you will actively and consistently participate in one of the group ministries of the church. Prayer groups, men groups, cell group, women's group, youth group, fellowship groups that are at least approved and sanctioned by the under-shepherd of the church. If you don't know who that is, that is the pastor. Number five, that I will explore, discover, and regularly use my gifts for the edification of the body of Christ here at Village. In other words, you're not just warming the pews or the chairs. Number six, that I will refrain from behavior and speech that leads to division and confusion in the body of Christ. Accordingly, I will not live my Christian life as a gossip, a mischief maker, nor be involved in the slander of another member of Village Baptist Church. Also, by saying that, you're saying you're not going to be a garbage receptacle. You're not going to let anybody come to you to dump their garbage. Because there are people who know people who are garbage receptacles, and they know who to go to when they have garbage to dump. If you turn them away several times, they won't come to you. And number seven, lastly, that you promise that when for any reason you have to leave the fellowship at Village Baptist Church, you will immediately join another Bible-believing church. If your job moves you from here to Chicago or to Lagos, Nigeria, or to Tokyo, Japan, or wherever, that you will immediately, the first thing you will do is find a church that teaches the Bible and speaks in a language you understand. That's all. And it's all from the Bible. We're going to deal with some of the Bible passages in, the, in our membership class. That's all God is asking us. That's all we're asking. That's what it takes to be a covenant member of the church. Any question before I close this out? Oh, wow. That opens another box. Okay. In other words, why be a covenant member anyway? Yeah. Uh, the one thing is that as a church, 
about 15 years ago or so, we decided that only covenant members would make decisions for the church. So if you're not saying, I'm going to follow the Bible, I'm going to come to Sunday school, I'm going to attend church regularly, I'm going to do this, you're not fit to make a decision for Christ. Yeah. The Bible says, if you love me, you will do what? That's, it's, it's all, that's the capsule right there. Uh, yes. That's a good question. And it's a question that has been debated in the church for a long time. And basically, what most denominations have agreed to is that it will be left to the church to decide what age is the age of accountability. Uh, some churches have gone as low as nine. Say so if you're nine years old and you're active and you're this and this, you can do that. Some churches have gone to what the country requires. In other words, if you're 18, you can do all this. Because most of our decisions that we make as a church, the pastor doesn't just come and say, this is what we're going to do. Uh, or any member of the church, whatever. It's, it's proposed, and it's discussed, and it's voted on. So whoever it is, my thing is that you've got to be able to uh, reason and be able to vote. So someone like Perion, for example, I will trust him to vote because I can, I can see that he can reason and he can think and, and uh, uh, he tithes even though he doesn't work, but anything is given to him, he tithes. I can, I can tell that. Uh, so... That, that, and, and tithing is really also very uh, critical because tithing doesn't mean you have to give the church money. It means that if you do work and you do have money, you need to give 10% of it to God. If you don't work and you don't make any money, you're not required to give. Birthday gifts, uh, any, any gift that is given to you, uh, you're supposed to tithe on it. Any inheritance you make, you're supposed to tithe on it, or whatever. As long as you say this is a blessing for, from God. If you think it doesn't come from God, then keep it. The church doesn't want it. But if it's a blessing from God, if God allows you to wake up and go to work, then what you make is a blessing from God. So you give... Uh, you know, 10% of it. So basically what I'm saying is uh, the age really doesn't matter that much except if we think the person is too young to be able to think critically about those things. Okay. But at, at any age, as long as they subscribe to the seven, you know, and, and by the way, let me say this. There are a lot of people that have signed the papers and the paper is just as good as the Golden Gate Bridge being owned by me. Okay, so we don't just go by paper that you sign. Okay, if you're working, for example, and we look at your given for the year, and it's 150 for the year, we know you must have been working in Siberia, you know, to, to, get that, to give that much to God. Because in America... In California, the minimum wage is, you know, it's 75. So if you have a job, there's a way we can calculate and roughly know what your minimum income should be. So there's a minimum that you can give to the church to be required to be considered a tither. So, yes. Mm -hmm. So the great guidelines for, you know, the greater, the greater, um, the, like other congregations. Other congregations, yeah. Well, the different congregations, again, that's why we said we're autonomous. Uh, if you're in a Catholic church, you're not autonomous. Yeah, some Presbyterian churches and some Anglican churches, it's not autonomous. In fact, it, you know, we had a covenant members meeting where we brought in issues, we discussed them, we voted on them. In the Catholic Church, you can't do that. The Pope tells you what's going to happen. 
If you don't like it, go join another church. Okay? Some Presbyterian, some, uh, some Anglican churches, uh, some Methodist churches are that way too. You don't even get to vote on who's going to be your pastor. Somebody sends him to you, and if you, if you don't like, go sue them. You know, I mean, that's going to... Huh? Well, some people have tried it. <laughs> but, but the point is that we in the Baptist church believe in the autonomy of the local church, uh, but we believe also that the autonomy doesn't mean freedom to do anything. Okay? Uh, we cannot decide we're going to use another Bible. We have to follow the same Bible that is given and passed down to us by the apostles and the writers. Yes. Uh, definitely. Yeah. That's, you, every, everybody that wants to be a covenant member, a pamphlet, uh, a book, is given to them. This is it. And it includes all of that. Benefits of church membership, how Baptist churches rule their church, and on and on and on and on. The importance of the word. We even give you work. You do work lessons in there and things like that. And I can tell people who've gone through it and people who have not. People who've gone through a stay in the church. People who haven't dropped out. All right. God is good. All the time. All the time.